hi, this is Tawny from the Dirty Bits Podcast, and you're listening to California Dreaming on the Orbital Jigsaw Network. Warning, this episode contains details of multiple violent murders, including the killing of young children, and is not suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Also, The story I will eventually get to today was a listener's suggestion by Stephanie, a fellow Californian and true crime enthusiast. Many thanks for reminding me of this case. Do you, listening out there, do you guys like a good mystery? I do to an extent. I don't cover many stories that end without a conclusion. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've covered any at all. I like a good story, but... When I'm done with an episode, it's not likely that I'm going to come to a happy ending simply based on the subject matter of the show, but I do tell stories that usually end with a measure of justice being served. Not always as in the case of the murder of Bonnie Lee Bakley, but even when a case grows cold or the investigation takes a long time, eventually most of my stories can be wrapped up with a conviction and a good prison sentence. I haven't told a story that's truly unsolved. A story that's shrouded in mystery, intrigue, and endless theories as to what actually happened. Sometimes those frustrate me. Unsolved murders frustrate me. Missing persons do too. But I find them absolutely intriguing nonetheless. I can get caught down a rabbit hole or two if I let myself. but. I try not to. Some podcast shows have brought up the concept of Occam's Razor. I'd never heard of this until I began listening to podcasts several years ago. It's basically a philosophy, a line of reasoning that states the simplest explanation is usually the right one. It's used throughout the world as a means to slice through problems or situations in order to eliminate unnecessary elements. That's where I like to be, looking at the simple explanation as being likely the right explanation. It's not always the case, as you will find out later in the story I'm going to tell you today. But, if you allow yourself, you can only follow so many theories, go down so many rabbit holes before you get overwhelmed. I'm like that. I can easily get lost in the minutia of a case. You get caught up on something that might actually have nothing to do with the case. If I were to talk about a story that didn't have a resolution, I don't think I could ever figure out a way to come to a conclusion for you guys. I most definitely am one that needs to wrap it up before I sign off for the day. But today's story was a mystery for quite some time, and I'm going to get to it in a bit. But I want to talk a little bit about some of my favorite mysteries, some missing persons, some you've probably heard of. You guys remember the show disappeared on the Investigation Discovery Channel? I'm fairly certain many of you out there listening have seen it, or at least heard of it before, but in case you haven't, I'll give you a little background on the show, and I want to talk about some of the episodes that I've heard on other podcasts as well as some that have been resolved since the show first aired. But I'm not going to go too deeply into those stories. I will tell you which podcasts you can find out more about each one as I go along. Disappeared is a documentary-style television series that presents the story of a missing person where they have interviews with relatives, friends, investigators, and law enforcement related to the missing person's case. The show weaves into each episode reenactments of the events surrounding and leading up to the disappearance. Most of the episodes usually involve the disappearance of one person, but occasionally there's an episode that involves more than one person disappearing together. The original run of the show lasted five seasons, and that's when I was an avid viewer. The show went on hiatus for about three years and then returned to the network in April of 2016, and has aired two seasons so far in addition to the original three, with tentative plans for an eighth season. Full disclosure, 
I did not watch seasons six or seven as religiously as I had the first five. Probably for a few reasons, but likely because the first five seasons aired during the exact time that I wasn't working. I binged a lot of Investigation Discovery. I watched all those shows. I watched all the big trials that took place during those years between 2009 and 2013. So by the time seasons 6 and 7 came along, I simply wasn't watching TV as much as I used to. Disappeared, at least in its original run, was definitely a favorite of mine. I liked the style of the show. I enjoyed the way the stories were presented. Very easy to watch and listen to, and most of them ended in a mystery. There were a couple of episodes where the missing person was later found alive, but most concluded without knowing what became of the missing person. I would go online, and I still do, to check for any updates. There are lists online of the people featured on Disappeared with the status of each of their cases, although some of the lists haven't really been updated. I've heard several cases that were featured on Disappeared as subjects of podcasts, and I mean other than Maura Murray and Tara Grinstead, who have dedicated podcasts exclusive to their disappearances. One story I heard from Disappeared on several podcasts was the disappearance of Zeb Quinn. I've listened to a story on Insight, Thinking Sideways, and I'm pretty sure on Generation Y also. He was a young man who went missing January 2nd, 2000 in Asheville, North Carolina. He ended his shift at Walmart where he worked in the electronics department around 9 p.m. that Sunday night. He had planned supposedly with a man named Robert Jason Owens with whom he worked at Walmart. In addition to being co-workers, the two were also friends. Zeb had been looking to buy a new car and Owens told him that he knew of one for sale in a neighboring town. Zeb met Owens in the Walmart parking lot and they left together, but in separate cars, to go look at the vehicle for sale. They were seen on surveillance video at a gas station down the road about 15 minutes later purchasing sodas. According to Owens, after leaving the gas station, Zeb flashed his headlights, a signal for him to pull over, telling him he received a page and he needed to return the call immediately. And if you don't know what a pager is, you can Google it yourself. I'm not going to get into the pre-smartphone 90s technology right now. So anyway, after returning from a payphone, Owens claims Zeb was agitated and that he needed to cancel their plans to look at the car, hurriedly got back into his own car, and as he went to take off, accidentally rear-ended Owens' truck. A few hours later, Owens was treated at a local hospital for fractured ribs and a head injury that he claimed he sustained in a second car accident that evening, although no report was ever filed with police. Zeb's mom reported him missing the next afternoon. Two days after Zeb was last seen, a man purported to be Zeb called Walmart to tell a co-worker that he wasn't going to make it into work, that he was sick, but the co-worker, knowing Zeb, was suspicious and did not recognize the voice on the phone as Zeb's. The phone call was traced to a Volvo plant where Owens also worked. He admitted making the phone call but claimed he was doing so for Zeb who had asked him to call in for him. About two weeks later, Zeb's car was found in a parking lot near his mom's work running with the headlights on, some pink lips painted on the back window, and a black lab mix puppy inside the car. It's still one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard of happening in a missing person story. Anyway, the case grew cold. But fast forward to March of 2015, when the very same Robert Jason Owens was arrested in connection to an unrelated disappearance and murder of Food Network star television contestant Christy Codd, her husband JT Codd, and their unborn child. Owens would later go on to admit to the killings of the Cod family and, in order to avoid the death penalty, pleaded guilty to two counts of dismembering human remains and on April 27, 2017, he was sentenced to 60 to 75 years in prison without the possibility of parole. On July 10, 2017, Owens was finally indicted on charges of first-degree murder 
for the death of Zeb. As to the whereabouts of Zeb, that still remains a mystery. Hopefully, with this indictment, those questions may finally get answered after all these years. Well, moving on. I think on the very first episode of the Thin Air podcast, host Daniel and Jordan told the story of Charlie Allen Jr., also known as Neil Babson Maximus, a missing person from Massachusetts who was also featured on Disappeared. His sister last talked to him on October 11, 2007, when she noticed his Facebook page had been shut down and called to ask him why he took it down. He said that he didn't and that some people were after him and that he didn't feel safe and that he was thinking about moving back home with his parents. About a month before he disappeared, he legally changed his name to Neil Babson Maximus, so when referencing the search for him, both names are usually listed. Following his disappearance, extensive land and aerial searches failed to find him, as did a second one on the one-year anniversary of his disappearance. There was one reported sighting at the time he vanished that raised his family's hopes that he was okay. A woman in Dartmouth told police that a man wearing only pants and tennis shoes entered her house through a second-story window around 3 a.m. on October 12, 2007, the day after Charlie was last heard from. She said the intruder appeared to be confused and that he was looking for one of his friends who he said that he thought lived there. Police found Charlie's tennis shoes not too far from the woman's house a few days later. They also found his backpack filled with school supplies in the woods near the college. In interviews, Charlie's parents indicated that he did struggle with bipolar disorder, which caused him to become manic at times, and it put a strain on their relationship. And his senior year at UMass seemed to be going okay until he decided to stop taking his medications to treat the bipolar disorder. He left messages with his parents that he was either going someplace warmer, like either to Florida or Texas. The 10th anniversary of his disappearance happens to be this week, and the family is no closer to knowing what happened to him now than they were 10 years ago. I've also heard the very strange story of the 1999 vanishing of Lori Bible and Ashley Freeman, who were also featured on Disappeared on a couple of podcasts. I'm pretty sure their story was on thin air as well, and I want to say on Case File, and most recently on the Unfound podcast. On the evening of December 29, 1999, Ashley was celebrating her 16th birthday with her family and her best friend Lori, who was also there at their mobile home in Venita, Oklahoma. Ashley's boyfriend was there too, but he left around 9.30 p.m., Sometime during the night, or in the early morning hours of December 30th, 1999, a fire erupted inside the Freeman's mobile home. A neighbor called the fire department at 5.30 in the morning. Lori's parents and police searched the area for the Freeman's and Lori because no one could be found. Ashley's mom was found dead, but her dad, her, and Lori were still missing. Police theorized that Ashley's dad killed her mom and abducted the two girls. However, a day later, his remains were found in the rubble as well. And as it turns out, they had both been shot in the head before the fire was started. But the girls were not there. And to this day, no trace of Lori or Ashley has ever been found. The Thinking Sideways podcast also told the story of Ray Grecar, the district attorney of Center County, Pennsylvania, who was also featured on Disappeared. On April 15, 2005, Ray called his girlfriend to tell her that he was driving through Brush Valley, an area north of where he worked. He never returned home and was never heard from again. His girlfriend reported him missing that evening. The next day, Ray's Mini Cooper was found in the parking lot of an antique store in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. In it was his county-issued cell phone, but nothing else, and no signs of foul play, and there was no bank or credit card activity that could be traced. More than three months later, 
fishermen discovered the county-issued laptop that belonged to Ray in the Susquehanna River beneath a bridge. An analysis of the computer showed that the hard drive was missing. Two months after that, someone else recovered the hard drive on the banks of the same river about a hundred yards from the location of the laptop, but it too was severely damaged and all attempts to recover data from it failed. There has been no other information on the case and Ray is still missing to this day. Another story from Disappeared that I've heard on several podcasts, including Generation Y, Insight, and the Misconduct Podcast, is the story of the Jameson family of Ufala, Oklahoma. The three of them, Bobby, Sherilyn, and Madison, mysteriously went missing October 8th of 2009. They were reportedly looking to purchase a plot of land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. Their remains were found more than four years later, on November 15, 2013. The cause of death is unknown, and the circumstances surrounding their death still is a mystery. Also from Disappeared is the story of Stephen Kocher, whose disappearance was covered by the ladies on Insight, along with a special guest host from the Vanished podcast. On December 13, 2009, 30-year-old Stephen Kocher drove his car from St. George, Utah to a very affluent, exclusive suburb in Henderson, Nevada called Anthem, for reasons nobody has been able to figure out why. At approximately 12 p.m. exactly, a home surveillance camera recorded what is believed to be Stephen calmly, yet deliberately, walking down the sidewalk out of view. The person in the video does not seem to be disoriented, but walked as if he had a definite destination. He appears to be holding something like a manila folder or an envelope under his arm. Stephen has not been seen since, despite extensive searches of the areas surrounding the Anthem neighborhood. The Unfound podcast has a story on its website that delves a bit deeper into the Stephen Kocher disappearance, but also on the Unfound podcast, he covers the disappearance of Susie Lyle, also a featured story and disappeared. On Monday, March 2nd, 1998, Susie attended classes at the University of Albany that day. Then, at 4 p.m., she got ready and left for work. She spent the evening at Babbage's, a computer software company in the Crossgates Mall in Gilderland, New York. She was a whiz on the computer at a time when the technology was still somewhat new to most people. At 9.30, she left work, got on the bus to return to her dorm. She got off the bus at her stop on campus. This was confirmed by a classmate who was waiting there and saw her exit the bus. Somewhere in the three to five minute walk from her bus to her dorm, she vanished. The next morning, her boyfriend called her parents because he couldn't get a hold of her, so they immediately contacted campus police to report her missing. They also contacted her credit card company. They informed her parents that at 4 p.m. later that same day, her debit card was used at a nearby convenience store ATM, but, as luck would have it, none of the surveillance cameras at the store caught who it was using the card the correct pin having been used too. Like all others, Susie hasn't been seen or heard from since. April Pitzer was also covered by the Unfound podcast and disappeared. She vanished on June 28, 2004 in Newberry Springs, California. She was last seen by Chuck Hollister, a man in his 60s with whom April had been residing at the time. According to Hollister, he dropped her off at a bus stop in Newberry Springs after helping her pack her belongings as she had had plans to return to Arkansas to live with her mom. She never arrived in Arkansas and she has never been seen or heard from since. Another intriguing story from Disappeared that was the subject of an episode of the Apex and the Abyss podcast and Thinking Sideways was the disappearance of Ben McDaniel. On August 20th, 2010, 
employees in the dive stop at Vortex Springs in Ponce de Leon, Florida, noticed that a pickup truck had been in the shop's parking lot for two days without having been moved. The truck belonged to Ben McDaniel, a man from Tennessee who had been a regular cave diver at Vortex Springs. He was last seen by two shop employees two days earlier on the evening of August 18th, underwater on a dive entering a cave 58 feet or 18 meters below the surface. While he is believed to have drowned during his last dive, and his family believes his body is in an inaccessible reach of a very narrow and extensive cave system, no trace of Ben has ever been found, and the circumstances surrounding his disappearance are baffling, and the family has entertained the idea that Ben disappeared voluntarily, staging the scene at the cave to make it appear that he never emerged from the dive. But at the same time, they don't really believe he would do such a thing, knowing he would be causing his family a great deal of heartache, particularly since his parents had lost another son, Ben's younger brother, in 2008. Ben was officially declared dead in 2013. Also from the Disappeared television series, a story that I've heard on a number of podcasts, including True Crime Garage and Insight, is the disappearance of Matrice Richardson. Her case, like the others, is very bizarre, although her remains were discovered nearby where she was last reported seen approximately 11 months after she vanished. On the evening of September 16, 2009, Matrice went to dine at Joffrey's Restaurant in Malibu, California. Because of what staff and others dining at the restaurant would describe as bizarre behavior and the fact that Matrice was unable to pay her bill, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department from the Malibu Lost Hill Station were called to the restaurant. They administered a field sobriety test, but she was not intoxicated. But she was arrested on charges of not paying for the meal and possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. Her phone, purse, and money were secured in her car, and her car was towed, and she was detained and booked at the Malibu Lost Hill Station. Matrice's mom called the station, expressing concern for her daughter's mental health and wanted to know if she was going to be released so she could come pick her up. She was told Matrice would not be released until the morning. Despite being told that, Matrice was released that same night at 12.28 a.m. in the morning. A spokesperson for the Sheriff's Department stated that she was released because she exhibited no signs of mental illness or intoxication, and she was an adult. She was spotted a few hours later in the backyard of a nearby resident resting, which he reported to the sheriffs. When he went back to look for her again, she was gone. There were no other reported sightings of Matrice, and 11 months later, her naked, mummified remains were discovered near a creek bed in Malibu Canyon. There were no signs of foul play, and her death was not ruled a homicide. Another case that I briefly want to discuss on Disappeared that was covered by True Crime Garage and Thinking Sideways is a story of the Springfield Three, two girls and one mom, Cheryl Levitt, Suzanne Streeter, and Stacy McCall, who all went missing together in 1992 from Missouri. Susie and Stacy had graduated from high school on June 6, 1992, and had been reported to last been seen around 2 a.m. on June 7th when they were leaving the last of a few graduation parties they had attended that night. They had planned to spend the night at their friend Janelle Kirby's house, but when they decided her house was too crowded, they left to go to Susie's house for the night. The following morning, around 9 a.m., their friend Janelle and her boyfriend, who had expected the girls to come back over that morning to go together to spend the day at the water park, went over to Susie's house because they had failed to show up. They found the door unlocked, but no sign of Susie, Stacy, or Susie's mom, Cheryl. But their cars were parked outside. 25 years later, there has been no sign of the three ever found. And it's yet another completely baffling case. One last missing persons 
which is one of my favorite stories on Disappeared that was recently the subject of an episode of Insight, is the disappearance of Leah Roberts. On March 10, 2000, Leah reportedly took her 1993 white Jeep Cherokee, leaving South Carolina for Washington State, a cross-country road trip. Three days later, her sister reported her missing. The next day, she had Leah's roommate search her room and found much of her clothes were missing, suggesting that she had planned a lengthy absence. She apparently took her new kitten with her as well and left a note that said she wasn't suicidal and reassured her sister and her friends that she would be back. She also left enough money for a month's worth of bills and expenses and suggested that she would be returning. Her sister traced her credit card usage to a motel in Memphis and then some food purchases along the 40 and eventually to the 5 North where the 40 ends in California and the 5 it takes you north to Canada. The last card purchase was made March 13th in Oregon. After that, no other transactions were made. On March 18th, Leah's sister got a note in her mail slot from her county sheriff asking her to call the sheriff in Whatcom County in Bellingham, Washington. She learned that Leah's Jeep had been discovered in a remote forest, but Leah was not found with the vehicle. The Jeep was severely damaged and clothing was strewn about the road. Some of it had been tied to trees and branches along the road. Washington State Patrol determined that the Jeep had been traveling approximately 40 miles per hour when it went off the road based on the damage to the car and the trees it hit on the way down. The contents of the car being strewn about suggested the car rolled over multiple times, but there was no blood or signs of injury that would suggest anyone was in the car at the time that it rolled. Since there seems to have been no indication anyone was in the vehicle at the time it crashed, it led to speculation that the accident was staged. But oddly enough, There were blankets and pillows hung inside the windows, suggesting that it had been used as a shelter since having been wrecked. Leah's passport, checkbook, driver's license, clothes, guitars, CDs, jewelry, $2,500 in cash, and remnants of cat food were all found, but no cat and no Leah has been seen since. I'm so absolutely fascinated with these bizarre and mysterious disappearances, but I've also come to realize something about the show Disappeared. It doesn't always tell the entire story, or some of the facts and details are left out, or some individuals involved in the cases misrepresent themselves or the facts. If any of you were to ever go back to season one of Disappeared and watch the episode dedicated to Maura Murray, I think you'll find a great deal of information about Maura's background was omitted. And I mean, even today, investigators are no closer to solving her disappearance than they were then. But the portrait of Maura that was painted for the disappeared episode was very, very different than the Maura we who've listened to the Missing Maura Murray podcast have come to know now. I wasn't thinking about the details of the show at the time, I pretty much watched it for what it was and took what the show presented at face value. Of course, the family and friends of the missing don't want to air everybody's dirty laundry, and I get that. They want the attention on their missing loved one's story, and not the other details of the lives that are seemingly irrelevant. I speak of Maura Murray's case as an example because not knowing anything about the story, if one were to rely solely on disappeared as their source of information, then you would think of her as this all-American, West Point attendee, University of Massachusetts nursing student who inexplicably vanished into thin air. But if one were to dive deeper into her story, you'd find there are a whole bunch of details about her situation that, at the time of her disappearance, some criminal charges, some drinking issues and possibly some issues with her boyfriend, all lending to the speculation as to her state of mind at the time she went missing, all of which could quite possibly have the viewer's perception of Maura shift a bit. 
Disappeared tells a good story, and I'm still a fan, but it doesn't always tell the whole story. Many of those featured on Disappeared remain missing to this day. Most of them, as a matter of fact, are still missing. But a few cases have come to a conclusion since their specific episode aired. Most recently, Brian Barton, who had been featured in Season 3 in 2011. His remains were found this past August behind a church less than a mile from where he'd been living at the time, 12 years after he went missing. Braden Fuchs's disappearance was also featured on Disappeared in Season 2 in 2010. He went missing in July of 2009 from Olathe, Kansas, and his remains were found six years later in May of 2015 in Casper, Wyoming. He had driven all that way, almost 800 miles, to end his own life with a single gunshot wound to the head. Another missing person featured and disappeared whose remains were found long after their episode aired was a story of John Glasgow, an Arkansas businessman who went missing in January of 2008. His remains were discovered by hikers on Petty Jean Mountain, Arkansas, more than seven years later in March of 2015. But the cause of his death was ruled undetermined as there was no visible trauma to his skull or bullet fragments discovered at the scene. His case remains open for now. There was always something about Disappeared that captivated me. Maybe it's the mystery surrounding the vanishing of a person, especially if there's some weird circumstance surrounding their lives in the days leading up to them having gone missing. And in the last three cases I mentioned, Brian Barton, Braden Fuchsa, and John Glasgow, were three that were missing for many years before their remains were finally discovered in the last couple of years, including one just a month or so ago in the case of Brian Barton. And each time I heard the news that their respective remains were found, I felt the sense of sadness for the families, because any hope that their loved one was off living a new life somewhere else in the world was gone. I felt sadness for the missing person, these three men were each struggling with issues in their personal lives leading up to the time each of them went missing. I feel sadness that they left this world completely alone and that it took so many years for them to be found and returned to their loved ones so they could be laid to rest. The others I've mentioned that have been covered by podcasts, Maura Murray, Leah Roberts, Stephen Kocher, Ray Gricar, April Pitzer, Susie Lyle, Ben McDaniel, Charlie Allen, Lori Bible, Ashley Freeman, and the Springfield Three, and many others that have been featured on Disappeared. I'm kind of just waiting for time to pass, hoping that maybe someday some vigilant hiker or hunter or cyclist or random passerby will someday discover their remains, and one by one, their mysteries will be solved. Sorry I went on so long about the show, but it's one of my favorites. And so many of my favorite podcasts have done a wonderful job covering some of the most mysterious disappearances, so it's worth a mention. And hopefully, if you already haven't, you may find your way over to some of those shows and listen to their take on these mysteries. But today... I'm going to tell you the story of one family who went missing and was featured on an episode of Disappeared on their season 3 premiere episode in 2011. When their story went to air, it had been less than a year since the family had gone missing. And looking back upon it now, at that particular episode of Disappeared, it's easy to see how a flawed police investigation, false leads, and the presentation of information that has no basis can lead investigators to jump to conclusions that cost the family way too many years in finding a resolution to the mystery of their loved one's whereabouts. Today, I'm going to tell you a story that is going to span two Southern California counties, the story of a family that seemingly vanished without a trace on a February evening in 2010, in today's episode of 
The Tale of the McStay Family Joseph McStay, age 40, his wife Summer, age 43, and their sons Gianni, 4, and Joseph Jr., 3, lived in Fallbrook, California, a census-designated area located in San Diego County. Claiming the title of the Avocado Capital of the World, Fallbrook is known for its avocado groves and has an annual avocado festival in the downtown area every year. It's the place the McStay family decided to put down roots when the growing family quickly found themselves cramped in their small apartment that was located right on the oceanfront in San Clemente. They were beach lovers. Joseph was an avid surfer. Summer enjoyed bike rides with her kids and her dogs along the boardwalk. The family took full advantage of living so close to the water. There is no doubt about that. They definitely needed a bigger place, though, for their growing family. And living on the beach was not going to be in the budget any longer. It was not without a great deal of heartache and soul-searching that the couple decided it would be best for them to move some distance from the water into a much bigger yet more affordable home in Fallbrook, which would unfortunately take them further inland and away from the beach that they loved. But it was a sacrifice they had to make in order to accommodate their family, their pets, and Joseph's blossoming business called Earth Inspired Products, or EIP. He made and manufactured indoor waterfalls and decorative water features, and his business was booming. He had started off building these water features in his garage, and soon he was having to bring in help. He hired outside waterfall manufacturers to help him keep up with the demands for his work. By all accounts, Joseph was living his dream. Working from home was enabling him to be around his family more, and Summer, at first reluctant and heartbroken to have to leave her beachside home, soon embraced the new house and delved into redecorating the place and making it their own. The future was looking bright for the fun-loving, free-spirited couple and their two toddlers. So, on Thursday, February 4, 2010, just a couple of months after finalizing the purchase of their new home, having not even really unpacked or completely moved in yet, the family of four seemingly vanished off the face of the earth from their new home in the San Diego suburb. A few days had passed since anyone had heard from the family, but red flags did not immediately go up for their relatives and friends. Yes, the mixed days had gone unusually silent, but the family just wasn't too concerned. Joseph was busy with his business, Summer was busy with the house and the move, and of course they were busy with their boys. It was coming up on the President's Day holiday that following Monday, so Joseph's brother Michael supposed that maybe they took an extended vacation. But by the weekend after the family was last seen, Joseph's father, Patrick McStay, living in Texas, had been unable to get a hold of his son, which was unusual. He usually talked to Joseph once a day. The family was very close, and this amount of time to have passed without having heard from Joseph was concerning. Patrick insisted that there was rarely a day that would go by that they didn't talk, and if, for some reason, his son were in trouble or needed to reach out to him, he would have. There would be no reason for his son to not call him or return his calls unless something was very, very wrong. So the entire mixed day family has disappeared, and nobody was really taking notice or was very much concerned. But from Texas, there was very little Patrick McStay could do but wait. There are a couple of things a month or so prior to the disappearance of the family that are going to play a pivotal role in the investigation into what happened to them. Back on December 4th of 2009, someone, and it's presumed to be Summer McStay, made an email inquiry about purchasing software to learn Spanish, which had been advertised on Craigslist. 
Almost two months later, on January 27, 2010, someone used the McStay Home computer to make inquiries on About.com in regards to traveling to Mexico and passports for children. January 31st was the McStay's youngest son, Joseph Jr.'s third birthday. Three days later, on the morning of February 3rd, there was a computer inquiry regarding creating invitations to a children's birthday party. That same day, a friend came to their Fallbrook home to help with painting the interior. This friend spent half the day helping and agreed to return on Saturday the 6th to continue working. This would be the last known face-to-face -face interaction that Summer and the kids would have with anyone. Patrick recalled speaking to his son that morning of the 4th. There was no indication that anything was wrong. He had a lunch meeting with a business associate at noon in the city of Rancho Cucamonga, California, which was almost 70 miles to commute to. So his plan was to leave the family home pretty early, which he did in the family's Isuzu Trooper. This lunch meeting and the business associate he was meeting with would become an important part of the investigation later on, so remember this. Summer stayed home, taking care of the children and the renovations of the house. Summer also spoke to her sister on the morning of the 4th to make plans to visit her and her new baby. At 2.36 p.m., Summer's credit card was used to purchase beach bags, infant pajamas, and a jacket from a Ross department store in Vista, California. At 3.52 p.m., there was a home computer search for children's toys on Craigslist. At 4.25 p.m., there was an outgoing call from the home phone to Joseph's cell phone, which pinged the Fallbrook Tower. This would be the last outgoing call from the home phone. Between 5 p.m. and 5.47 p.m., there are several text messages between Joseph's phone and Summer's phone. At 7.47 p.m., a neighbor's security surveillance video caught the family's white Isuzu trooper leaving the cul-de-sac. Only the bottom portion of the vehicle is visible on camera. The occupants cannot be seen. Later on, from what was found at the home, it appeared that the family left either in a hurry or unexpectedly. At 8.28 p.m., Joseph calls his business associate in Rancho Cucamonga and discusses work. His cell phone again pings off a Fallbrook Tower. For the next two days, over February 5th and 6th, friends and family repeatedly call and text both Summer and Joseph and get no responses. On February 8th, around 7 p.m., a surveillance camera picks up images of a group of four people, presumably the McStay family, walking across the border into Mexico. This video would not be discovered until a few days into the investigation, but it will be an important component of the story a little bit later on as well. On that same day, February 8th, around 11 p.m., the family's Isuzu trooper was towed from a parking lot two blocks from the U.S.-Mexico border in San Ysidro, California. Security guards tell investigators that the car was parked and left there sometime between 5.30 and 7 p.m. that evening. On February 10th, in a response from Joseph's business partner for a welfare check, San Diego County Sheriff's deputies go to the family home and knock on the door. There was no answer, and from what they can see from outside, there seemed to be no signs of foul play. On February 13th, Joseph's brother, Michael McStay, comes to the home to check on the family. He is accompanied by Joseph's business partner, Chase Merritt, who shows Michael how to get into an unlocked window. They look around and see some things left out. That was somewhat unusual, but Michael didn't find any of it alarming. Things such as eggs left on the counter and a mess of popcorn on the futon. The house was in disarray anyways because of the recent move, and none of it raised any alarms with Michael. He had also noticed that the dogs, which had been left outside, had been fed, and there was a large bag of dog food sitting outside the back gate. 
This also led him to think that his brother and his family were on an extended vacation and had hired someone to take care of the dogs. But Patrick McStay wasn't having any of it. He had been growing more and more concerned that he wasn't hearing from his son. Finally, he was able to convince his other son, Joseph's brother Michael, to report the family as missing. On February 15th, Michael McStay filed a missing persons report for his brother, his wife, and their two toddlers. Deputies arrived at the home, but also appeared to be unconcerned about the possibility of the McStay home as being a crime scene. They do not seal the property off. They do not restrict entry into the home. They simply ask to lock it up as they obtain search warrants. On February 19th, San Diego detectives obtained search warrants for the mixed day home, their cars, and their computers. On February 23rd, Interpol issued an alert to be on the lookout for the mixed day family. I want to pause here for a moment on this alert. What did this mean for the investigation to have Interpol alerted? Interpol, or the International Police Organization, is an international association that facilitates worldwide police cooperation. It has memberships of police forces in 192 countries and is politically neutral. It focuses primarily on public safety and battling transnational crimes against humanity, child pornography, cybercrime, drug trafficking, environmental crime, genocide, human trafficking, illicit drug production, piracy, illicit trafficking of works of art, laundering, organized crime, corruption, terrorism, war crimes, weapon smuggling, and white-collar crimes. So, for the mixed day disappearance to have been reported to Interpol, I find this to be an interesting move on the part of the San Diego detectives investigating this case. It would appear at this point, within three weeks of the family having been last heard from, they seem to be convinced that they have inexplicably gone to Mexico, which, as you will come to see later on as I take you through this story, that was a huge misstep in this investigation. With the computer searches they found on the family home, searches for how to learn to speak Spanish, searches for travel into Mexico, the inquiries about children's passports, the family vehicle being parked two blocks from the Mexican border, and that grainy surveillance camera video of an apparent family of four walking into Mexico the same night the Azuzu was parked and subsequently towed. They seemingly just went with that theory. And if that was going to be the story they were going to go with, one can only imagine the impact that this would have on the investigation as a whole. If you're convinced the family is vacationing in Mexico indefinitely, you're probably not going to be looking at any other possible theories or suspects. Would this be an example of the San Diego investigators utilizing their Occam's razor in deciding on a theory in this case? Is the family going to Mexico the simple answer to this mystery? I don't think I would have thought that this was a plausible conclusion to reach. Maybe I've watched too many TV shows and listened to too many podcasts, but for me, the simple answer is something terrible happened to the mixed days. How sad is it that that is the likely scenario that I jump to first? I'm sure I'm not the only one, and honestly, being that the San Diego investigators and police have probably seen the worst of the worst out there, I don't know why they didn't jump to the conclusion that I've jumped to either. All those families on Disappeared who say something like, my hope is that my loved one is somewhere on a tropical island, in a lounge chair, on a beach, with a fishing pole and a Mai Tai in hand. I'm like, that's not where your missing person is, but if that's what they need to tell themselves in order to cope, I get it. But your police, 
you've got to think of all of the scenarios that are possible, even the worst ones. Well, in this case with the McStay family, they weren't convinced at all that the Mexico theory held any water. Despite all of the circumstances pointing investigators to take that theory seriously, the family just knew that this wasn't the case. Something caused the McStay family to leave their home that night in a hurry. Something led them out of that house, and they either left in a hurry, but with food and eggs and coffee grounds strewn about, popcorn all over the place, all indications that they had intentions of coming back. But then there's the question of why. Why would Joseph and Summer suddenly leave close to 8 o'clock at night with two young children? Where in the world would they be going? And if they were going to Mexico, where were they between the night their Azusa trooper was seen leaving the neighborhood on surveillance video to the time it was reported abandoned and towed away on the 8th? The circumstances of the mixed day's disappearance was completely puzzling. With San Diego investigators pretty much convinced that the family is someplace in Mexico, Patrick McStay was going to have to take matters into his own hands. He would go on to spend the next four years attempting to investigate the disappearance of his son and his family tirelessly day and night. He would wake up first thing in the morning and search the computer, search websites, look at Facebook and all of his emails hoping that anyone would have sent him any kind of information or leads as to the whereabouts of his son and his family. If he wasn't going to be able to answer the questions about where his family was, he was going to try and figure out why they are missing. Why is this happening to them? What was going on in their lives that might have caused this? Was someone in the family being threatened? Patrick would not stop until he got the answers he was looking for. And with that, I am going to bring part one of the tale of the mixed day family to a close for now. I will bring you part two next week, where I will delve into the rumors that surrounded the family, suspicions that swirled around Joseph's wife, Summer, a bit about her past, including a variety of aliases that she had, a big lie that she told, an accusation that she may have been trying to poison her husband, and some emotional issues that she dealt with, the possible involvement of an ex-boyfriend of Summer's, his criminal background, as well as his inability to let his relationship with Summer go. And you'll find out what actually happened to the family, where they ended up, and the evidence investigators were able to uncover and who that evidence led them to. And if you absolutely cannot wait until next week to hear part two, it will be available for Patreon supporters at the same time this episode goes live on Orbital Jigsaw. So for a donation as little as $1, you can get early access to part two. But, it will be available for everyone one week from now. If you are already a patron, or if you become one, I will be in touch with you shortly to make sure I get my newest show stickers out to you. Thank you so much for joining me on this, the 15th episode of California Dreaming. I appreciate your patience in waiting for me to get this story up for you guys. I've been under the weather, and even as I'm recording this, I'm hoping that I don't sound too nasally or congested, because it hasn't completely cleared up. I'm hoping to be back to my usual self soon, especially in social media. I've been neglecting that very badly, too. But everything should be back to normal very soon. Follow the California Dreaming Facebook page and on the discussion page, you can follow me on Twitter at California Pod and on Instagram at California Dreaming Pod. California Dreaming is now very proudly a part of the Orbital Jigsaw family of podcasts. 
a network that brings you such fantastic shows as The Concession Stand, where hosts Nick and Andy geek out over all things entertainment, or Super Nerds UK, where hosts Ben, Ian, Tim, and Simon take an irreverent look at pop culture, or Busted Wide Open, a show where Nick and Sir Ian Dangerous take you on a weekly journey through the hottest news in sports entertainment, or Historium, a podcast devoted to the strange, obscure, or otherwise interesting stories from history. Or is this adulting, where best friends Stephen and Chris break down the stigma on mental illness through the lens of comedy? Or the Dirty Bits podcast? Join host Tawny Plattis for her casual retellings of the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories your history teacher likely left out. Or... 41 Owned, a show where hosts GT, Dak, Kevin, Jack, and Matt fill your ear holes with all things gaming. And of course, Insight. Join hosts Allie and Charlie as they take a new look at true crime, mysteries, and forgotten history. And lastly, Insight Junior, a podcast that explores mysteries, myths, and legends designed for all ages. If any of these shows sound like they might pique your interest, Visit www.orbitaljigsaw.com and click on their links. Also, don't forget to visit the Orbital Jigsaw Family of Podcast Merchandise Store, where you can get all sorts of California Dreaming stuff. T-shirts, hoodies, phone cases, stickers, mugs, and notebooks. You can support me and your other favorite creators by visiting the Orbital Jigsaw Store. I'll post the link in the show notes and on social media. I'd like to take the time to thank a few of you who have taken the time to leave a review on Facebook and iTunes. On Facebook, thank you to Jennifer, Fiona, Bree, Jonna, and Camille. And on iTunes, thank you to Regina's Ray, ABHL Pete, and Radhain, Jen in the Dream, Stephanie L., Mary, Ezreda, KittenLeeb76, DaxWorld, ZBT453, NCP Chirp, Vince Fan for Life, Cold Case MM Podcast, Potty Girl 9, and The Word DDDD. Thank you all so much for taking the time to leave those five stars and kind words. Email me at CaliforniaPod at Yahoo.com if you want. I'm still giving out show stickers for all these reviews. I also have a couple of friends who want to tell you a little bit about their shows. Take a listen. Hey, how are you? Do you like an extraordinary story? Do you like a Scottish accent? Well, you're going to love Extraordinary Stories podcast. Join me, Barry Henderson, as I walk you through some of the craziest stories you will ever hear. The stories I tell They can be true crime, survival, sex, identity, obsession, love, and everything in between. They can be shocking, heartbreaking, funny, or dark. But they're always, always real. So, get yourself into Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Thanks. Do you enjoy being a fly on the wall? getting to listen in on a conversation and learning things about the people involved? Hi, I'm Rhett Hall, and I host the Brain Trust Brothers podcast where every week I bring the audience along to listen in on a conversation between myself and someone that I find interesting. It could be another podcaster, an actor, or just some guy from down the street. You never know what you're going to get, but you can always count on it being fun, informative, and entertaining. You can find the podcast every Tuesday on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or by visiting braintrustbros.com forward slash podcast. Join me as I try to make the world a better place, one conversation at a time. Thank you again so much for listening. I will see you either right now on Patreon for part two, or next week right here and until next time sweet dreams